the Hebrews have paid a big fine and they are subject to the Assyrian king. And Pekah says, no, I'm going to take out the Assyrian king, which generally is frowned upon in Assyria. Um, and so the result is TP3 attacks again. And this is that double attack in 733 and 732. And the conquest and deportation of many areas in the north, including probably Chatzor, the region of Galilee, the tribal area of Naphtali, possibly the city of Dan, and almost certainly the city of Bethsaida. All of these were obliterated under Tiglath-Pileser III. Um, after Pekka, we have another usurper, Hosea. He is basically an Assyrian puppet established by, um, uh, by the Assyrian king. He pays tribute to King Shalmaneser V. Then he turns around and makes an alliance with Egypt against Assyria. Shalmaneser didn't like that, attacked him in 724. And remember, he, uh, he himself was imprisoned. Samaria was besieged, and this is the end of the northern kingdom. Um, Sargon II comes along and you have the sack of Samaria in 722. So ends the northern kingdom. All right, anybody want to catch your breath now? <sighs> we got really fast. So what's the aftermath? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You didn't mention Shalom? Yeah, yeah. Did you? Uh-huh. I didn't see it. I got missed it. Right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's a quickie. He's a quickie. Yeah. Anybody else? No? Okay. So the aftermath. Well, we've already really talked about this. What was the Assyrian policy when you conquered somebody? Broomsticks. What? Broomsticks. Broomsticks, yeah. Broomsticks for the select. Select. Who out? What do they do with the rest of the population? <laughs> Moved them. Remember, deported the whole bunch. So they sent them all and dispersed them within Assyria. And so the aftermath is quite literally the northern ten tribes of Israel are gone. They're, they're taken away from Israel and they're dispersed and by and large they're going to lose their identity. Um, they are not going to think of themselves as Hebrews anymore. They'll intermarry, they'll get lost, they'll die off, whatever. Um, and we don't hear about them anymore. Um, by the way, it's at this time that some of the people may have gone down to Ethiopia. Um, there's some, some uh, talk about that, some evidence of that. Um, also then the Assyrians brought into Israel some Assyrians. And they built administrative centers and that sort of stuff. I'll show you some of the buildings they built at, at Megiddo, for example, which was one of their major administrative centers um, there in the north. So now, did you notice, whenever an author repeats himself, it's always a good idea to pay attention, isn't it? Authors, I mean, papyrus is expensive. Everything's being written and copied by hand. Um, when an author repeats himself, he's not doing it to waste paper, right? He's doing it because he wants you to pay attention. So whenever you see a repeat, and what's the most repeated thing over and over and over again as you go through the Northern Kingdom? So and so did all of them did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And what's the nature of the evil? Committing the sin that Jeroboam caused Israel to commit. How many times do you read that? Lots and lots and lots, right? Over and over again. Do you think the author wants you to pay attention? You think the author wants you to pay attention? So what is the sin of Jeroboam? If we can understand the sin of Jeroboam, we can understand this repeated refrain. The sin of Israel that ultimately was destructive to Israel. The sin of Jeroboam which he caused Israel to commit. I would suggest to you that the sin of Jeroboam was divided loyalties. The sin of Jeroboam was divided loyalties. See, Jeroboam had a choice to make. Jeroboam is very understandable. It was Rehoboam's fault that the kingdom split, not Jeroboam. It was Rehoboam's fault. Jeroboam is certainly understandable in saying the way you're behaving, Rehoboam, is not okay. We're not going to go with you on this. That whipping of scorpions and so on. But then Jeroboam had a choice to make. He knew that the identity of his people was wrapped around their loyalty to the God of Israel. He also knew that he was going to face likely political problems. He was going to have trouble maintaining his own power if the people kept going back to the south to worship. 
and therefore he made a decision. He made a decision to place political loyalties alongside religious loyalties. In fact, to subordinate matters of faith to matters of pol political power. The sin of Jeroboam is divided loyalties. He is more loyal to his own power and the political integrity and strength and stability of the kingdom he is establishing of Israel as a separate entity. He's more loyal to that than he is to the God of Israel and God's law. It's not that he's disloyal to the God of Israel and God's law. He's saying, worship the God of Israel. Just do it here. Worship the God of Israel, just do it this way. I'll even, give you a, I'll even give you an aid. How about a golden calf? He's not disloyal to the God of Israel. What he has done instead is he's tried to mix the two into one. He's tried to mix political loyalty to the kingdom of Israel, political loyalty to Jeroboam, with loyalty to God. He's tried to put them together. He's got divided loyalties But if we understand the sin of Jeroboam in that way and people kept following in his footsteps, we can also then understand that the sin of Jeroboam is not dead. In fact, all of us deal with it all the time. Because the temptation to mixed loyalties is very, very high. We need to be clear. It is very common in my country, maybe some of you in, in other countries as well, it's very, very common for Christians to support, say, a particular political party. Now, they don't all agree on which political party, <laughs> but, but they tend to support a particular... Well, what is that? That is mixing of political and religious loyalties. And that is dangerous because the next step is very easy and that is Christianity is subordinated to the political aims of the party and so Christianity simply serves to baptize the platform of that particular party. By the way, this happens all the time in my country. I suspect it happens plenty in other countries as well. Um, that's just speaking of politics, but we do it in many other ways too. We tend to, um, for example, equate the interests of my country, say, patriotism, for example, nationalism with the will of God, right? Um, probably the French are the most famous for this, but Americans are close behind, and British are close behind. But the idea of that um, God particularly favors the French. God particularly favors Americans. God and we, we tend to think that, and so God justifies our political agendas in the world. And of course, we always say this from an insider perspective, right? It's my country and God and country, as if these things go together. One of the things I love about being here is you're all from different countries. You're from a bunch of different perspectives. And so you won't let each other get away with that, will you? <laughs> right? Um, you're from this kind of perspective. God is not the God of my country. God is the God of the universe. For me to think of God as the God of my country is to cheapen God and diminish Him to an extraordinary extent. The power of God to work in my country is no different than the power of God to work in any other country. Although He may have a little bit harder time getting through to my country sometimes. I can say that. But He has no trouble getting through to Canada. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Any Canadians here? Do we have any Canadians here? Oh, yeah. All right, there we go. He has no trouble getting through to Can Canadians. Um, but you get the idea, don't you? I mean, it's real easy for us to mix up those things. This is, by the way, if you, if you um, I don't know if you've paid attention to these things, but an extraordinary thing happened in the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, um, where you've got, um, especially Britain and France, but especially France, which in, let's say, 1800, France was like 90% Christian. <coughs> By 1900, it was like 2% Christian. You've got a massive de-Christianization of France. It happened in many other countries too. Why? Precisely because of the sin of Jeroboam. Precisely because the French 
national church, namely the Roman Catholic Church at that time, not to pick on Roman Catholics at all, but, the, but um, they identified their, their cause with the French elites, the French aristocrats, and when the French Revolution happened and so on, it basically began to blow up that, uh, that identification of causes, right? That God is in favor of the French aristocracy. God is in favor of the French monarchy, and this is the way it is, and to defy those things is to defy God, and when that started to happen, a lot of French people said, if that's what kind of God we have, no thank you anymore. And you get massive dechristianization of France. Um, it's been happening all over the world. It is happening rapidly in my country. And remember, one of those distinctives about what, what most identifies Christians is Christians are too political. That's what people mean. That is, Christians are quick to identify themselves with patriotic causes or to identify, that is, cause of country or cause of a political party or whatever it is. And I would suggest to you, and you know because you're here, God is just so much bigger than that. That for us to, to diminish God in that way is extraordinary. That's what Jeroboam is doing. Jeroboam is saying God, God is our God here, up here in Israel. And God, we worship God in this place and in this way. And in doing so, if we do it just that way, we make sure also to uphold our political power, our political integrity, our separation as the ten tribes of Israel. We're not them in the south. All those sorts of things get all mixed together. That is the sin of Jeroboam. But I have to tell you it is really really easy for us to get trapped in the sin of Jeroboam isn't it it's really easy for us to confuse loyalties and I think sometimes at least for me I have to take a step back and say wait a minute let me try to view this from God's point of view let me try to view our world from God's point of view wow you mean God's not American <laughs> You mean he's really interested in what's happening in Korea? You mean he's really interested in what's happening in Norway? Right? You mean he's really interested in what's happening in Greece? Who pays attention to Greece? He's really interested in what's going on in Hawaii. Our heart, we, I, I, I have trouble saying this, but I feel like we need to have a check on our heart from time to time to take a step back and say do I do I really honor the God of the universe do I do I really understand what the God of the universe I mean understand I'm not gonna understand <laughs> what, entirely what God's up to but but view things from God's point of view of this great world and all these people from all these different countries all these different perspectives all these different languages all, and somehow the grace of God is at work and alive in all of them He's doing marvelous things in all of them. And for me to disrespect any of those things, what a tragedy. And for me to confuse loyalties and to identify the cause of God with the cause of my country, how sad. How demeaning. How demeaning of me and how demeaning of God. So, I would just say, by way of application, that it's healthy from time to time to take, maybe to take a look around this room. See, it's easy for you people, right? Just take a look around this room and, and honor the way God is at work in the people around you, the way God is at work in people that you disagree with on certain things, the way God is at work in different places, the ways that you can't even imagine, the, the ways, the different way. One of the really cool things that I enjoy here is when, when you all get together for worship, it's like this massive diversity, right? I mean, there's a certain characteristic of YWAM worship, right? But nevertheless, if you look around the way people are doing, you'll have some people jumping up and down, and you have other people dancing around, you have some people singing real loud, and you have some people being real quiet, and some people kneeling in the corner. Have you paid attention to this stuff? Think of that from God's perspective. It's all beautiful. So completely different, but so beautiful. Is our God really the God of the universe? Is our God really the God of all nations? That, I think, that understanding is the only antidote to the sin of Jeroboam. Let's have a prayer. Lord, we're challenged by this thing. We are such finite creatures and we're so easily drawn into different loyalties. God, give us eyes to see just how big you are, just how grand is your work 
How marvelous is your kingdom in so many different languages, in so many different cultures. Uh, God, we simply marvel at the extent of your embrace. And God, we also recognize ourselves as a small but important part of that, and we join your people in all the world, in all of history, in that great praise of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you ready to do some archaeology? Yes. All right, from the, from the grand vision of the universe to the dirt. We're going back to the dirt. So uh, take about three or four minutes, stretch break, and I will try to figure out how to make this thing work. Oh, good, it's working. Okay, I've got it working, so uh, come together and we'll do some archaeology. All right, now I have to beg your indulgence. Um, if you are on a computer or smartphone or whatever, if you would please uh, refrain from using the wireless at this point because the, um, uh, you'll be eating up bandwidth that I need <laughs> to be able to get this thing through quickly. Um, this is fairly high resolution stuff and the result is that it can be fairly slow if, you, if uh, many people are on. So don't go here now, but later, here's the URL. Moses.Crichton.edu forward slash VR. Okay, so that's the website that we're visiting right now. This is called the Virtual World Project, and it is sponsored by Crichton University, hence the Crichton.edu in Omaha. A friend of mine, uh, a couple of friends of mine are the people who developed this. I was um, kind of a consultant for them um, as they were developing this. So and it's, it's a very cool site. It allows you to basically walk around archaeological sites without being there. But it's the closest thing you're going to get to actually being there. Okay. So and you uh, you might want to take a motion sickness pill because I might make you sick. But um, so let me show you basically how you get here. What what you do? Uh, oops. Okay. So here's the entry page, and what I'm doing is I'm going by regions, so I'm going to go uh, click on regions, and then it gives me different regions. We're going to be looking at mainly Galilee and Golan region, and so I click on the little arrow, and then it gives me the, the sites that are in that region that we're going to visit, and we're going to visit um, Tel Dan, okay? So we're going to start out with Dan. 
And of course, Dan was then one of those two sites that Jeroboam set up in the north. So this is uh, Tell Dan. Okay, what you're seeing, by the way, Tell Dan is a lovely site. It is really, really cool. And a lot of people don't go there. Did you go there? Yeah, yeah you went there. Um, so Dan is way up here. So you go to the Sea of Galilee and go north, and basically the, the border of Israel is right around here, right about Mount Hermon. So Mount Hermon is um, a big, like almost 10,000 foot high mountain. And it's often, much of the year, it's snow capped. And the snow melts and it, uh, big springs come out at the bottom of the mountain and they form the headwaters of the Jordan River. Okay, so if you, if you go from here, you can see here's Mount Hermon. The springs are right here and they come out and form the Jordan River and the Jordan River goes through, you know, the Sea of Galilee's part of it and goes all the way down and then ends at the Dead Sea and there's no outlet of the Dead Sea. You're all familiar with the topography here, right? Okay, so um, because of this, this, these springs are coming out up there at the top and it's, it's like a garden. It's just beautiful, uh, beautiful clear water coming out. There's even a waterfall up there, a really nice waterfall. Um, and you can see here the different springs on the, along the site. And when you go to visit the site, they, they uh, have you go in. So you basically have to do a nature walk along all these little springs and stuff and these little, little creeks that are coming out of the headwaters of the Jordan. It's just beautiful. Um, so, we are going, uh, by the way, Caesarea Philippi in the New Testament is, well, it's just like a mile that way. Okay, so it's also right at the headwaters of the Jordan. So, the, that's the New Testament site. Right next to the Old Testament site of Tel Dan is Caesarea Philippi. So, what we're going to do now is uh, take a little walk, shall we? We're going to walk through Tel Dan and look at a few key sites. Now what you do, these little circles, so, that, so what you're seeing is the plan, and, and you're seeing different, um, different colors represent different periods. So this kind of magenta color, that's the time of Jeroboam, basically. Okay? So this stuff, so we're going to come in the city gate, and then we're going to turn up, and then we're going to go up here to the temple complex. Okay? So um, uh, that's, that's our basic approach. So, what you do is you click on one of these circles and they have cameras. Uh, technically, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, this kind of photography, this is iPix photography. So it is a, um, a stationary camera on a, on a tripod and they're taking segmented, uh, the, well, they're taking basically movies in, in a 360, okay? And, and then you edit these things together and the result is that you can look around and you can zoom in on things and whatever. So, um, it's, so th what you're moving is from tripod placement to tripod placement as you go through the site. So, first of all, let's go here. So, um, we are looking at the city gate complex of Tel Dan. Now I can, I'm going to try to make this full screen and see if I mess it up. Okay. Now, so what you do is you, uh, you know, you can, it's a little bit hard to do with a mouse pad here, but you can left click on your mouse and look around. Okay. So we're going to go. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. So, <laughs> so what you're looking at here is the city wall. Now this is partially reconstructed. So one of the things about archaeology is you, when you excavate, you don't, very seldom do you find anything very tall. You're finding foundations of walls. And typically the foundations of walls are six inches, maybe a foot, is what you actually discover. Unusual level of, of uh, preservation might be two or three feet. Anything taller than that probably is partially reconstructed. So what they did is they put rocks back on top where they fell off, they think, and to give you a better feel of what it looked like. Typically, what they do then is they mark, there's a, some sort of a line there that's hopefully unobtrusive that helps you see the line between what they originally found and what's been reconstructed. Okay? So look right here. See that little bit of mortar right there between the rocks? So in other words, this rock is what they originally found. Everything above that line of mortar, all that is reconstructed. 
<laughs> okay? Um, but notice it goes up and it goes up over here. So they found everything below that line there and everything above is reconstructed. You see that? So, but this is a nice reconstruction job. This was done by the Israeli Antiquities Authority. I mean, this is very professional based on the archeological evidence. Notice that the wall is thick. It's got big offsets to it. The nice thing about having offsets in a wall is you can not only throw stuff down in one direction, but you can throw stuff down in another direction, right? So it's good for defenses in that way. Now, what we're looking at here is a big plaza. So notice the, this is normal Iron Age paving. So this is a paved courtyard. And um, we're looking at this, there, there is a, uh, if you want to approach this city, there's a little small external gate right here. But then we start into the main gate complex. Right there. Okay, so we are going into the outer gate. Now, remember the keys to stopping an enemy when they want to lay siege to your city, you want to do damage to them, right? You want to cause them lots of problems so that they can't attack your city very easily and so they'll be hesitant. So one of the things you want to do is narrow them down. So you can see it right here, can't you? You come into this plaza and now you've got to narrow down. This is just over three meters wide. So it's kind of like a funnel. You narrow everybody down and they have to go through a door. The door was right here. Here's a threshold where the door was. Okay, so they have to break down a door and get in here. Another nasty thing you can do to an enemy is um, make them turn. It's really hard to turn an army. And so if you have a group of people, a huge group of people, right, if they can come at you with a wide front and come straight at you, you're in trouble. But if you narrow them down and then you make them turn, they can only put their shields one way. Right, if you make them turn, you expose their side. And here, you're narrowing them down to two by two here. And now, look, if you go straight ahead, you run into a wall. You're going to force them to turn left. By the way, look what's on the right. A tall wall. And you can throw stuff down on them the whole time they're going through here and trying to turn. Yes. Okay, so now we're going to go in and we'll go right here. Uh, let's go right, yeah, we'll go right here. Okay, now let's turn around. There we go. All right, that's where we just came from. Okay, we just came through that opening, and now we're up where that wall is where you have to turn. So if we keep going, looking around. Oh, look at that. What is that? That is a high place. So that's a high place. It's about this wide. It's got two steps. That's a high place. So you would put a little altar there, or you'd put a pole. Remember the poles? Asherah pole, you put a pole there. Poles represent fertility. Asherah is a fertility goddess. Um, keep going. Doo -doo -doo. All right, so notice that when you came in, you ran into this wall here on the left. There, you ran into that wall. Now you gotta turn left. But if you keep going straight here, after you've turned left, whoa! We'll widen out a little bit, there we go. Um, there's a tree in the way. Now this tree's modern, of course, and this planter's modern, but you, you got, there's another wall just the other side of the tree. You gotta turn right now. So you come in the outer gate, you turn left at the high place, then you gotta turn right again to go into the city. So here's the right turn. So, so we'd be marching now after we made our first turn, and now on our right, on our right, there we go. That's where you have to go. So you're making them turn twice. And now we go here. All right, now we'll turn around and see where we came from. There's where we came from. There's the high place, see it? So we came in from the right, we came in from the right, and then we came this way, and now we have to turn this way. And so let's go where we're gonna march now. Oh, look at that. See that right there? See that standing stone? That's called a matzavah. The plural is matzavot. These are representations of guardian deities. These are gods. So these are, these are the protecting gods of the city. And often they have this stone standing, we call it a matzavah. Um, and and uh, the shape of the stone we call a stela, or stella. Okay, so now we're turning around. And what we're seeing here is Main Street. Now we're to the inner gate, and we'll zoom out, if we can. There we go, zoom out. The door would be right here and go right across there. 
Okay, so the door would close up against, look on the ground, you have this bump. See this bump? This is a, a step up. Here, you're taking a step up here and then a step down there and when the door closes, it closes up against those stones. And if you notice right here in the center, there's one stone that's taller than the other ones. That's the center where the two doors join. Okay, so the doors would close right there, that would be the center. And what is, why the bump, you might ask? Did you ask why the bump? Why the bump? This is a speed bump. One of the major weapons of the ancient world is a chariot. If you want to attack the city with a chariot, you can get a chariot through that gate. And you come in here, and you go right here, and you blow the wheels off the chariot. Okay, so it's literally a speed bump. You're not going to attack the city with a chariot. Okay, now, look carefully, and you can see tower on the right. Tower on the left. So as you're standing right where we are trying to batter down that door, people are throwing like cattle on you. And now, if you break down the door and you get over the speed bump, you get to meet the gate chambers. Remember that? Yeah. The gate chambers. So here is a gate chamber on the right. Here's another gate chamber back here. Here's another gate chamber over here. Let's take a better look at them. The walls in between the gate chambers we call piers. So now we're going to stand up on top of the pier and we're going to look at the gate. So here's the speed bump from the other side. You can see the center stone there. We call it the threshold stone, that whole risen area where you close the doors. And we see chamber one, pier, chamber two. See it? And then, ooh, and then nothing. There's Main Street again. We keep going around. Chamber three, chamber four, and back to the speed bump. So we have here what? A four chamber gate. Remember the six chamber gates were the Solomonic gates. This is after, this is a four chamber gate. So this is kind of a wimpy gate. Although it's not really a wimpy gate. It's pretty good size, but it's not as big as the, the, the great Solomonic gates that we had at Gezer and Chatzor and Megiddo. Okay, so we have now made outer gate, two turns, inner gate, four chambers. If you make it this far, you've gotten roundly beat up. On the way in, good luck attacking Dan. Remember, Dan is the very farthest north city in Israel, so you are the closest to guess who? Broomsticks. <laughs> right? Do you want to protect yourself when you're in this town? You bet you do. What's the typical width of the, the main road there coming in? The what? The width. The width. Um, three, three, to, three to three and a half meters. So fairly narrow. Only probably two people. I mean, maybe three could come in at a time if they really squeezed, but mainly two people could come in at a time. And it's yeah. Uh, inclined. yeah, this whole, you can see this whole thing is inclined. So that's also works against you when you're attacking, you're going uphill. Okay, now we're gonna go uphill. And we're gonna go up here, and we're on the road, on the road again. Okay. And where are we, let's see. And, ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, nothing there, okay. <laughs> Oh no, I don't want to go there. Ah, cut it out. That's where I want to go. Okay, now look here. There we go. Okay. Here we have another high place. Just one step up. And look what you have here. We have a carved stone block and it has kind of a, a basin carved into the top of it. You see that? What's going on there? Well, we found a couple of these and I think I know what's going on. Um, this is for a ritual that you would do. Um, you would take a, that would be filled with water. And you would take a, um, uh, they had like a mug with holes in it. And you take a scoop of water and kind of go swish swish with the mug on Matzavot that would be behind it and that way you're honoring the gods as you go by. Okay, so this is a, a ceremony once again to a, a, a protector deity of some sort. Okay, and now where are we gonna go? Let's see, we'll go over here. Later, 
Now, what we, the stuff we've just been through, that's all Jeroboam period. Although this, I'm not sure if this is Jeroboam period, that, that thing, but the, the gate complex was Jeroboam period. Um, this, there's actually another gate, another four chamber gate, a little tiny one right here. Um, so that you'd have to go through if you want to um, uh, get into the site, but that's built later. Okay. Now let's go, whenever, you, uh, as far as navigating this, you want to go to a different area, you're okay. So we just did this, okay, we came through the outer gate, through this way and came up to the inner gate, and now we're going to jump up here to the temple complex. So you re read about Jeroboam taking his golden calves and building his alternative temples? Yeah. This is his temple. It's there, you can see it. So there is the altar complex. So that's where the um, sacrifices would be made. And then this building with the steps going up and this big platform, there's a building up there and that's where the golden calves would have been housed. Okay, um, and so you go up here and it's quite a large building you can see here, this, this uh, temple platform. Um, so when you think of the Jeroboam and his alternative temple site and worshiping the golden calves and all that sort of stuff and having his own sacrificial system and his own priesthood, that's it. It's there. Is that cool? So that is Tel Dan. Um, there's one more thing. I'm not going to show it to you because it's not in, uh, you can't really see it. There's actually, over here, there's a really cool, very ancient, Middle Bronze Age gate, way, way earlier than the Israelites um, over here, which tells us that people have been in here a long time. Uh, and, well, I can, I'll show it to you, but it's got scaffolding. It's made of mud bricks entirely. This thing is made of mud bricks, and it's actually got one of the oldest arches. The doorway has an arch, it's one, and made entirely of mud bricks, and they're not fired. So this is really vulnerable to erosion and that kind of stuff. That's why they have it covered. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the oldest arches in the world. They actually build an arch out of bricks for the doorway. Okay, let's go back. And now we're going back to another site. Where are we going to go? Let's go to Chatzor. Yeah. Yeah. All right? Chatzor. All right, looks like Hazor. Can you Hazor? Sounds so weird. Chatzor. <laughs> All right, so once again, you see the, the um, nice plan and the color coding that lets you know the different periods, that these different things are from different periods. Now we are particularly interested in purple. Purple is Solomon time. You might remember Solomon time. You might remember this, for example. Remember this? So this is the, let's make it bigger so you can see it. This is the city gate of Chatzor. So we're inside the city gate. Here's tower, tower, threshold, where they would have had a speed bump, but you can see all the stones have been removed here. It's just dirt. And you have chamber, 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 and, and, whoop, chamber. <laughs> okay, and here's Main Street going through. So this is the city gate complex that we already talked about. And, and uh, remember the chief archeologist there said that this comes from the, um, the time of Solomon. So that's the city gate complex. Now let's go over here. This is kind of cool. This predates the city gate. In fact, this predates the Israelites. This is Canaanite palace. So this was the palace, remember King Yabin of Hazor? who launched that coalition of five cities against Joshua, this is his house. Okay, this is the palace of Chatzor. So there you see it. And a really interesting little tidbit here. Let me see if I can find it. So here's the palace entrance. And it's all covered up because again, a lot of it's made of mud brick, so they want to preserve the, the mud brick. But we're not going to go inside. We're going to do this. We're going to go over here and look around the side, I think. Let's see. Yeah, there's a staircase which lets us know it's the second, at least two stories. Yeah, here we go.
we go. All right, there. And we'll zoom in. Woo! All right, look right here. Can you see right along there? See how it's dark right along that edge? So you got the red mud brick stuff here, but it's dark right along there. Do you see that? And notice that that is the that is above the palace. We're standing in the palace. That's above the palace. That's the burn layer. So when it says that Joshua came in with his troops and burned the palace, burned the city to the ground, this palace was burned, and that's the ash layer. Okay, so you can see it right there rather vividly, right next to the reconstructed, partially reconstructed palace complex. Okay. And remember now, that palace predates the Israelites, and that burn layer dates from about 1200. So that's why that um, that's why this is one of the pieces of evidence that favors a later date remember there's other evidence that favors an earlier date but that's not in the period I'm dealing with okay another little uh, thing we want to watch for over here is this so we'll go to this I think we'll go there we're going there here we go okay now look at this this is a very interesting building we're gonna zoom out so we can see a little bit bigger. There we go. All right, so here's a wall. It's a pretty long building. Let's say it's about 100 feet long. Maybe half again as long as this. Oops. Let's go. Let's go talk to her. Ah, there we go. Okay. So now you see the walls of this building, and in between, what's going on with these things? You might ask. Did you ask that? What's going on with those things? What are those pillars doing there? The answer is, we're not sure. But um, <laughs> imagine me saying that. <laughs> um, it may be, remember that we had in 1 Kings this association between Gezer, Chatzor, and Megiddo and places where Solomon kept horses and chariots. Do you remember that? They're in the same verse. The grammar is not quite clear how they're related. Some people think that what we have here is a stable complex and you would tie horses to the, uh, the each one of these openings then would be a stall for a stable and you could tie horses to those things or whatever. Um, that's possible. The problem is we don't really have any evidence. Only one of these has a hole in it. You might expect a hole to be there to tie onto or whatever. And only one of these has a hole in it, so that doesn't really fit. So what's going on here? We're not entirely sure. It could be a stable or it could be something else. We find a number of these. By the way, this is a uniquely Israelite construction. So only Israelites made this, and they only made it like the 9th century BC, 9th, 10th century BC. Um, it's a, so the, these pillars divide the, the whole building up into three parts, right? There's kind of three um, corridors. So, what do archaeologists call this kind of building? Are you ready for this? A tripartite pillared building. Yes. Aren't you excited? <laughs> a tripartite pillared building, which really tells you almost nothing except it's got three parts and pillars. Um, the latest attempt to explain this, other than a stable or something, is a shopping mall. Think of it. You go down the center aisle, and each one of these openings, then it opens up to a different shop. Right, and you're, you so you buy your goods or whatever, and this could make a nice little kind of. This is a this is a shopping mall. Isn't that nice? So, I don't know. Anyhow, we don't we don't know what it is, but it's kind of cool. All right, now what's really cool? Remember, I told you that one of the big questions: if you live in the neighborhood of broomsticks, <laughs> right? Chatzor. So if who's over here? Assyria, right? Broomsticks over here. Draw a big broomstick. Okay. Broomsticks are over here. Right? These guys live in fear of broomsticks. And these guys are right here. Right? So any, any of these attacks can, uh, if you're allergic to broomsticks, you want to be ready. So the, the um, Assyrians, you know, if they, if they uh, besiege you, you need to be ready with what? Food and water. Food is not a big deal. You can get food in. Grain lasts pretty well. But water? Water's a real challenge. This is a very big tell. Very tall. In fact, there are 24 levels of civilization at this tell. Okay, this is a really, really old tell. 
and it's very large. Because of that, even though there's a high water table, you are near the Hula Lake. The Hula Lake is this little, it's kind of more a puddle with reeds, um, but this, this little lake north of the Sea of Galilee. You're near there, so the water table's fairly high in this area, but here you are not at the Jordan River, you're, and you're up high. So where's the water? Down low. So how do you get to it? King Ahab took on this challenge, and they did an extraordinary thing. What they did is they dug a water shaft. From the top of the tell, inside the tell, they dug a water shaft, and here it is. Okay? Just wait. Okay? This thing goes down 75 meters. And this is huge. Um, you can see the modern stairway, so you can get some idea of scale. Here's the modern stairway that they made so that you can go down it safely. Right, so you can see the modern, there's the modern stairway, and you can see the spiral staircase you go down. Here's the ancient stairway, okay? And there's where you're going. You go down 75 meters, and they come to a point where they kind of, um, then they just start making a, an angled shaft going down. So let's see if we can find the angled shaft. Where are you? Woo, where are you? I know you're in here somewhere. Maybe it's there. Well, oh, there you can see down farther. Oh, look at there. We can go down there. Woo! Ah, there we are down at the bottom. What they did is they just kept digging till they hit water. It is an amazing piece of work. And we can turn around and get a sense of this shaft. The, this is just the last part. So the big square shaft that you saw goes down. Then you start this tunnel on an angle. Here's the tunnel on the angle, right, going up to daylight now. Um, so this is the ancient staircase here. Here's the modern staircase on top of it. And when you turn around, look at that. The water is still there. Now, when you go there, and you must go there, make sure you go down the water shaft. Although the last time I was there, it was closed because Lots of danger of rocks falling down on you. But they had, it's all, the stairway's all roofed and stuff. They're taking care of you. Isra Israelis have um, liability laws, kind of like Hawaii. Um, so the result is they're very interested in protecting people. Um, make sure you bring a flashlight with you because this is not lit. So bring your flashlight. And when you go down here, there's a really big rat. His name is Guido, so say hi to Guido for me. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so that's Chazor. Anything else we want to see here? Nah, that's good. Okay. How's our time? Whoa, we're rolling. All right, where are we going to go now? Let's go to Megiddo. Shall we go to Megiddo? Yeah. All right, let's go to Megiddo. Megiddo. Here we go. Now, Megiddo, I told you, Megiddo's been dug to death, right? Just ton There's 21 levels of civilization at, at Megiddo, so it's super dense, too, as far as all the stuff that you can find. Um, now, where shall we go? Let's go to the gate. Yes. You're all experts at gates now. Yeah. All right, look at that, a gate. Now, this is a Bronze Age gate. So this predates the Israelites. Okay, so, but this is how you would go. You would go through this gate. It's a little tiny four-chamber gate, four chamber gate. Uh, but we're, that's not where we're going. We're going over here, I think. Oh, okay, so they, now you can see the four-chamber gate. You've just come through it. Notice that this road is a lot narrower, and it's just a little tiny thing. All right, let's go, let's go up here. This is the Iron Age gate. Now, half the gate has uh, been washed away in erosion. So now they get one side. Um, but this is the gate that we looked at before when we looked at the, the uh, ones from the time of Solomon. So here you have, this is outside, here's Main Street. We're inside looking out, tower, chamber, chamber that's filled with rubble, right, there's a chamber that's filled with rubble, and then another chamber. So there's your three chambers on one side, right, this is a six chamber gate. The other side is washed away. <laughs> there's the old gate down there, the Bronze Age gate. So there's your Megiddo gate, I told you it's the least well preserved, and that's why um, dating it's hard because it's all been done over, there's just not much to it. Okay, so that's the gate. Let's go here. This is pretty cool. So 
um, all this talk about Asherah poles and Ashtaroth and Baals and, and all those sorts of things, um, what you're seeing here is a, an, a Bronze Age cult installation. This is a whole bunch of pagan temples and altars, all of them predating the Israelites. So this is a major center of worship. And you can tell, look at, look at how far down we're looking. See the cliffs on the other side? We're standing on top of one on this side. That's how far down you have to dig to get to that layer. Remember, these are the very lower layers. And the Israelite stuff is much higher on the tell. What we are looking at here is the foundations for a number of temples and cult installations, including this one is kind of a fun one. A round sacrificial altar where you take animals and put them on top of this and, and execute them, you know. Uh, and, so, and there's, by the way, where the last picture was taken from up there. So you get some idea. That's the Israelite stuff is up there, and this is the pre-Israelite stuff down here. And this is, some of this is early Bronze Age. Some of this stuff dates to 3,000, even 3,500 B.C. Mm -hmm. So a lot before the Israelites, some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So that worship that we're talking about, about those other gods, has been going on for a long time among these Canaanites in this area. Okay, let's go here. Okay, so what do we have here? Here, we'll, we'll do it from the other side. There we go. What do we have here? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. Yeah, okay. Tripartite pillared building. <laughs> is it a tripartite pillared building? Aren't you excited? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Now, you notice that it's been partially reconstructed, right? These pillars over here have been kind of squared off and so on. These are the originals, this was, and this is an original here. And, but when you look, um, let's see. All right, here's a reconstructed one. And notice you have pillar, pillar, and, and this thing in between. Pillar, pillar, and this thing in between. Well, pillar's missing here. Okay, whoa, there we go. All right, let's go, now there's, here's some originals, so let's see if we can get a little closer, shall we? Woo, look at that, see? Pillar, pillar, and this thing in between. What is this thing? It's called a manger. This is a feeding trough. So when you talked about Jesus being laid in a manger, that's a manger, a feeding trough. So it gives you some idea of what it looked like, probably. Most everything in this world is made of stone because we're used to thinking of things ought to be made of wood or whatever. They don't have much wood, right? But they got lots of rocks. In fact, there's a famous story told by rabbis. When God decided to create rocks, he made two bags full of rocks and he gave them to the angel Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel went flying over the world and he slipped and he dropped one of them on Israel. <laughs> <laughs> so half the rocks in the world are in Israel. <laughs> Oh, let's go back here. <laughs> Rabbis can always explain things. All right, let's go walk over here. Now, another big issue, water. Same deal in Megiddo. So here's Megiddo. Now, if you want to travel, if you are the Assyrians, if you are Tiglath-Pileser III, and you want to come down and attack Israel, what you're going to do is you're going to come past Mount Hermon, and you could bypass Dan, but you might want to hit Dan. But then you definitely, your, your main road from Damascus is going to go here and go by Chazor. You're going to stay close to the water because you want to drink on the way. Um, you're going to have to go by Chazor. Now, the main road, the main ancient highway goes like this. It goes along down to the Sea of Galilee, and then it swings out. Let's see, it swings out through the um, Valley of Jezreel, then it goes over a mountain pass right here to the Valley of Sharon, where my roses of Sharon come from. Okay? And then you hit the coast. We call that the Via Maris, the way of the sea. So it goes from Damascus down to Egypt. Okay? And that's the way you go. You go through this plain, you go right over that pass, and then you go down the coast. So this is the main trade route of the whole area, and Megiddo controls that pass. So Megiddo is a key to stopping anybody who wants to come attack you. So, because of this, this is the reason why when Solomon was no dummy, right? When he did his fortified cities, he did what? What three? Chazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. Uh, so Gezer 
is right here. So the Via Maris goes down like this, and if you want to go from the Via Maris and go get Jerusalem, you got to go up the hills and you go right by Gezer. So Gezer controls the foothills. So that's why he chose that, that particular site. Um, so, once again, we have the water issue, but this is different, more like Jerusalem. Megiddo has a spring at the foot of the Tell. That's why they built the place there in the first place. So what did they do? Instead of doing like they did at Hazor, where they dug till they found water, they already know where the water is, but they got to get to it from inside the walls. So they dug, but a very different kind of digging. They buried the spring from the outside so any enemy can't know it's there, because you know Assyrians, right? Assyrians are going to have a really good time with this. If they can get to your water supply, you know what they're going to do? They're going to throw a dead body in it. If you throw a dead body in a water supply, do you know what happens? Yeah, in particular, cholera. Have you ever heard of the, by Haiti? This is a really big issue recently. You know, what, um, when you get dead bodies in water supplies, cholera is a very natural thing that people get. Cholera is like a really bad case of diarrhea. You basically poop yourself to death. Okay, so it's a bummer. But you can imagine the Assyrians, can't you? <laughs> They've got a sense of humor, after all. You throw a dead body in there, and you wait till people have lots of you know bowel problems, and they say, "We have a way of stopping that." <laughs> Broomsticks. <laughs> so, what they did in this case is they dug a round shaft this time down, not quite as far, maybe more like 50 meters down, but still really deep, d digging this thing down. And when they get to the bottom then, so we're going down the modern staircase, we get to the bottom, and then there's a horizontal shaft, like a long, it's long, it's like, I don't know, 300 meters long? Something like that. it's a very long shaft, you can see that they have lights down there. So we just came from, you can see, up there, right? And now we're turning around, and we're going there. Okay, so let's go there. And when we get there, we see a rock. Ah, water. There's the spring. Okay, so you can get to it from inside. But what an extraordinary, imagine the work that went into this thing. This was King Ahab again. So this dude, uh, he, was, he was serious about his water. And you can look around, um, you know, he's serious about his paganism and his wife and water. Um, here we go, whoa! Uh, there, there's the shaft where we just came from. And then now, in the modern site, when you go there to visit, you go down the inside of the shaft, you go across, you go to the spring, and then you go up this staircase and you actually go out the, si the bottom side of the tell to the street. Okay, and that way it keeps one-way traffic flowing through this thing, because if you try to go two ways on these stairs, you'll start killing people. So, um, but that, remember, was buried when the water shaft was being active. They, they want that outside to be buried because they don't want anybody to know, or they can throw the dead body in the broomstick, you get the whole thing. Okay. So that is... Uh, Megiddo. Anything else? Oh, one other thing I'll show you from Megiddo. Remember, the Assyrians deported all those people, these Hebrews dispersed them, but they also brought in their own population, and Megiddo ended up an Assyrian, during the Assyrian period, it, after Samaria was destroyed in 722, a, a Megiddo becomes an administrative center for the Assyrian military. And these buildings that you're seeing, these walls right here, these are the uh, palaces and headquarters of that of the Assyrians. So these are all built by the Assyrians. So that shows you, you know, when they came in, um, what they did. So on that note, we're out of time. We will go to my home away from home, Bethsaida, uh, next time. Any questions? So the revelation down the wall. Oh. Oh, okay. So in the book of Revelation, there is this battle that takes place at Armageddon. That is a corruption of the Aramaic Har Megiddo. Har Megiddo, Har means the mountain. Megiddo is the place. So a valley of Har Megiddo would be the valley that's next to the hill that's Megiddo. So uh, remember our, we just saw this, our um, cultic installation from the early bronze period? Okay, if you look uh, right out there, 